Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jalen, and today I have the most important video that I will film this year on this channel, and it is the best fiction that I read this year. So, I've been unreasonably nervous to film this video because this is the one that's most important to me. I read mostly fiction every year. This year I read 75% fiction. It is my love, it's my joy, it's the primary reason why I read. And so giving you all recommendations based on everything that I read this year, just, it's important. I wanna do all these books justice and we'll see how this goes. <laughs> and since fiction is my baby, I was like, you know what? I'm doing top 15 fiction, giving you the hot recommendations and let's just do it. And I also, Put myself under pressure to also rate these books so i'm gonna go in reverse order from 15 up to number one so let's just hop into it coming in at number 15 i have acts of desperation by megan nolan i read this in one weekend and i could not put it down the entire time I found in my reading this year that this subset or subgenre of fiction in which we have a toxic relationship and a young 20 something navigating her own depression amidst her trying to find love is something that i tend to really enjoy despite it being incredibly devastating and bleak and hard to read this one is all of those things and i will say the one thing that keeps you propelled throughout this book is the fact that all the chapters are incredibly short and so you constantly feel like there's a momentum here. In a classic millennial fiction trope, we have an unnamed narrator who falls in love with this writer when she's in her mid-twenties, and she falls very quickly into love and obsession and longing for this man who ultimately abuses her. Nolan is an Irish writer, and I've seen a lot of comparisons to Sally Rooney's work, and while I do sort of in terms of prose, I understand those comparisons. This one is kind of upping the ante in terms of tension. Just difficult topic explored in terms of this unnamed narrator's addiction and the ways that she constantly sacrifices herself for this man. And when he ends up leaving her at a certain point in this novel, you see how she completely unravels in the ways that she tries to reciprocate for the lost, missing love that she had once had from this man who ultimately sees into those insecurities, plays with them to his own accord as a man. And so I think this is a really interesting look at what love obsession looks like when you're in your mid-20s and as a young millennial, but it doesn't really feel too in like the internet novel vein. It feels much more visceral and internal in the ways that she examines all of these things in this novel. And I think the prose is just stunning. Once you pick this one up, you will not be able to put it down. So I highly recommend it if you can kind of stomach some of the more sad and just brutal uh, things in this book. Switching gears a little bit, I have at number 14, The Strange Things We Become and Other Dark Tales by Eric LaRocca. This is an indie queer horror author who writes a lot of brief but very gut-punching horror fiction. This is a collection of nine stories that all are underpinned by this theme of loss and grief, but he explores these themes in a bunch of different lenses that I thought were all just masterful. Oh, I'm sorry, there's only eight stories in this collection, but I will say all of them are just magnificent in terms of how he uses a different kind of fear or unsettling something to get at you in terms of examining loss and grief and what that looks like, especially through a queer lens. And I think he is a voice that I haven't really read too much myself, and I just hope that he sees continued success because I know I contributed to this, but I filmed a TikTok in which I read his other book called Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke, and that blew up. Mm -hmm. And since then, I know he's had tons of exposure um, from many other TikToks that have gone viral, and I just was one of them that contributed to it. But I think he is going to be a very big up-and-coming horror writer, and I'm just glad to see more queer, dark fiction just enter the, the mainstream and seeing so many people read it. And I think this one will unsettle you, and if you like horror, I think this is my one recommendation this year. I haven't read a lot of horror, but this one really did it for me in terms of really getting at one of my deepest, darkest fears is death and grief, using, you know, thrillers and also just more internal stories and some that are a little bit more lyrical and poetic as, as well, and I just thought it was a really good, diverse um, collection in terms of showcasing his style throughout this collection. I think that's what a strong collection does, is really look at one theme usually, but also try to examine different forms and how to approach the theme in interesting and new ways, and I think he is very tapped into that, so highly recommend this one. At number 13, I have Virtue by Hermione Hobie. This is a book that I haven't really seen discussed too much on the internet, and I think I'm just kind of shocked because it's tapped into a lot of the present contemporary literature discussion, I find. So this one follows a young man who arrives in New York City to start an, at an internship at a 
uh, newspaper, I believe, and I think it's supposed to be like the New Yorker, essentially. You learn a little bit about his past and how he grew up in poverty, and he has escaped to New York to try to make a better life for himself, and this is all around the time of Donald Trump's inauguration, and so this is a book that really looks at privilege and virtue signaling. Once this main character, he gets to this newspaper or magazine, yeah, it's a magazine, he friends certain other interns in the office, and he also comes under the wing of this older, attractive white couple, and they invite him to stay at their summer house, and so that becomes sort of a romantic entanglement of sorts between the three of them. In the meantime, you see the ways in which Donald Trump's inauguration kind of plays on Luca, the main character's mind, and him trying to figure out how to be a good person, how to be virtuous, despite being a white man living in New York and trying to find his own way through poverty. Amidst his summer with this couple, he loses himself in the throes of passion with this couple, and meanwhile you learn what happens back in New York while he's kind of in this blissful vacation and the devastating fallout that ensues. And what's interesting about this book is that it's told from the perspective of Luca as a 30-something year old reflecting on his time around 2016 in the election and the impact that his decisions and failings have on him now that he is an older person and his various regrets and longings based on all that occurs. And so I won't spoil what happens, but I think if you love just deeply rich prose that also looks at all these kind of modern themes in terms of virtual signaling, police violence, white privilege, and the various failings of liberalism, I think you will adore this book. It's kind of like this blend of, I would say, like Beautiful World Where Are You by Sally Rooney, Second Place by Rachel Cusk, Fake Accounts by Lauren Euler, but it's also kind of its own thing here. This one has a male perspective, and so Hermione Hobie, it seems like she's trying to get rid of any like auto-fictional assumptions here with this book, you know, placing you in the head of a young white man. But I do think she explores this in a really interesting and innovative way that I haven't really seen done yet. And this cover is just gorgeous. I love this font, I love the blue, so it'll look great on your shelves as well. But I think it's a really interesting and intellectual text that I find myself thinking about a lot, and I just wish more people would read it so I could discuss it with more people. So yeah, this one's excellent. Coming in at number 12, I have Intimacies by Katie Kitamura. This one has seen a ton, a ton of critical acclaim lately. This is another of the unnamed female narrator <laughs> trope that's often seen in contemporary literature, but she is an interpreter who arrives at The Hague to work at the international court there and be an interpreter. And you learn at the start of this novel that she's recently lost her father, and so she's grieving that. But when she gets to The Hague, you see two sort of plot lines develop, one in which she is working as an interpreter, and she explores the different fault lines of trying to interpret for people, especially war criminals who she interprets for, and the ways that she has to be the voice of certain criminals and how that kind of plays with her own psyche and trying to embody what they're saying while also trying to remain herself and her own identity at a distance from these people who she finds to be despicable, and how it becomes in a sense impossible to do that or having to set aside certain things in your mind to get there. It really plays well with the personal intimacies that the narrator has in terms of her getting involved with a still married man and it's kind of unclear whether he's gonna leave his wife. I think they're married, or they're just together, but basically it's a little bit of a mess. She likes this guy who's still with a woman, and you see her explore that and the different intimacies that entail and how that plays into her work and how she kind of gets them a bit mixed in her brain, and you see it all play out in terms of her trying to navigate and find herself amidst these different intimacies when she has to be engaged with other people and trying to find her own identity through grieving while also being the voice of someone else. And so I've just never read a book like this before in terms of it being quite exploratory, analytical of interpretation and language and using it as a metaphor for certain personal intimacies. I just thought it was completely brilliant. And I also love Katie Kinemura's All the Separation and it's very similar in tone and style, but I think this one is even more successful in exploring these topics and feels a little bit more contained and I would say plotty as a separation is a little bit more um, wandering, I would say, in terms of a woman trying to find her missing husband. It kind of just sticks in that vein, but this one has a lot more going on and a lot more nuance. I've probably seen this one talked about a ton, but it's worth all the hype, I would say. At number 11, I have Filthy Animals by Brandon Taylor, an author who I absolutely adore and love. I read all of his criticism online as well. I read his first book, Real Life, which is my favorite book of last year. I'm always staying up to speed on his social media output because he is very online and I think it's interesting and he's funny, but this is a debut story collection from him. And at the heart of this collection is a set of linked stories in which we follow a young man who has recently left the hospital after a suicide attempt. And you see him as a college student navigate relationships with this couple who are dancers and they are in an open relationship 
relationship. Messi entanglement set into there. This one I think is very stylistically similar, I would say, to the Katie Kitamura novel I just talked about in terms of in this collection he explores personal intimacy and mines the depths of queerness as well. If you've read real life, it's very similar tonally to deep sense of longing amongst college students. Various messy dialogue and set pieces that he sets up is just really interesting in how he explores personal connection and how we deceive each other and betray each other within love. Every story looks at a certain relationship in the intricacies that ensue amongst them. This collection, while it does have a set of link stories, there are also a couple of standalones here, but they all feeling very contained within theme of longing and desire and intimacy and loss and depression. I think if you want a moody, reflective, and also quite intellectual read, I would definitely pick this one up. Okay, number 10, I have The Employees by Olga Ravin. This one was shortlisted for the Booker International Prize, which is why I read it this year. One of my projects I did was read the shortlist, which is the first time I ever read a shortlist before, and this one completely surprised me. It is a sci-fi dystopian speculative novel that I don't usually read. I don't often read sci-fi, but this one, when I read it, it blew my mind on every single page. This one is a collection of statements from a bunch of employees on board this spaceship that is set well in the future. All these employees reflecting on their personal longings, and some of them are human and some of them are not. And Olga Ravin really plays with this interesting examination of what it means to be human by blurring the line between the identifiable humans and the AI robots that also are on board the ship and work on the ship. This book opens and it's very mysterious as to what the ship is, what is the purpose, why are these people on the ship, what is going on here, like you're kind of left in the dark a bit, but I think it's so meaningfully done and as this book kind of unravels by the end of it, you don't learn a ton about what's going on with this ship, you don't learn a ton about individual characters, but what's so brilliant about this book to me, an exploration of not even late capitalism but end game capitalism and what that might look like well in the future when people's entire identity is subsumed by capitalism and working and how that looks in a very dark and dystopian lens. What kind of underpins the plot here is that a set of objects have been collected and they're on board the ship and it starts playing with the different employees on the ship. And so we have a committee that's asking the various employees what they're feeling with these objects on the ship. And you're a little bit questioning of like, what is this committee doing? What is the, what is the tea here? Like, what, this seems odd. Ultimately, this book does have a plot, which I wasn't sure it did when I started it. But by the end of it, it becomes this very, not thriller-y, but it just immensely surprised me where the story went. It gets a little bit more dark and depraved than I expected it to. So I think this book has something for everyone. I do think this is a bit of a challenging book. And one, if you're looking for an experimental sci-fi novel that's also quite literary and poetic, I would pick this one up. And it creeped me out and it made me think a ton and ultimately it was spooky in the best way. We love a weird takedown of capitalism. Very out there, but I loved it. Number nine, in a bit of a similar vein, I have Something New Under the Sun by Alexander Kleeman, essentially about climate disaster and climate anxiety and the end of the world. However, it also has so many more elements that I wasn't really expecting going into it. It kind of has this blend of, you know, environmental collapse, detective noir, another takedown of like capitalism, quite scathing examination of Hollywood and movie development. So we have this novelist whose book is being adapted into a film and so he goes to Hollywood while his family remains on the East Coast. The star of the film is going to be this woman named Cassidy who is essentially Lindsay Lohan. He becomes acquainted with her and what kind of ensues from there is there's this new product on the market called Water, Watt dash R, that is supposed to be a substitute for water that because water has since become quite rare to find and so we have corporate involvement in terms of trying to make up for the lack of water on earth. It seems that this corporate created water is starting to have an impact on people. I'll leave that suspicious for you. <laughs> but then also you see when Patrick gets to the novelist, he gets to Hollywood and the movie starts being developed, the two employees that are working on this movie it just seems that this movie is not actually being created and so Patrick seems to be kind of left in the dark as to what is going on. Meanwhile, back at home, his wife and daughter are at this certain sort of like cult, like wellness retreat in order to get in touch with the earth now that it seems that it's dying when water is no longer available. You see the kind of difference there between Patrick wanting to make money within Hollywood, this big corporate zeitgeist, and his family back at home who are trying to just become one with the earth when it seems like the earth is about to die soon. Meanwhile, in California, there's a bunch of wildfires going on. And so there's just a ton, a ton, a ton packed in here. But I do think Alexander Kleeman is the perfect novelist to tackle all of these things because she keeps everything so 
contained. Ultimately, this book does feel like detective noir in terms of Cassidy and Patrick trying to figure out what's going on with the water, what's going on with this movie. You learn more about Cassidy's past as a young child actress and the struggles that she sees, you know, growing up with the internet age. So it has everything that I love in it, but it does this in a really original way that I've never really read before. And I felt so excited reading this book and I, I loved the mystery of what was going on. I loved the dystopian lens and the clear like takedown of like capitalism and the impending end of the world. I thought it was so expertly done. I talked about this book with CJ and Hannah a lot after finishing it because I was just like, y'all need to read this. Like this was wild. I need to unpack everything that goes on in this book. Like it was just nuts. If you want something a bit challenging in terms of having a ton of different plot devices within one book that's ultimately underpinned by this idea of the end of the world and climate anxiety, I think you will really enjoy this book. Number eight, I have The Life of the Mind by Christine Smallwood. This is what I would call the quintessential depressed woman moving novel. <laughs> this is basically following one woman who is a, I think, adjunct professor, yep, of English, who has recently had a miscarriage. The book opens on, in a bathroom stall and she has had excessive bleeding. And so from that opening, we learn more about this woman named Dorothy and how she has different personal aspirations in terms of wanting to be a professor, hoping to get a permanent position, but it kind of plays with this duality of constantly wanting to aspire for more as a young woman, but also being pinned down by the certain restrictions of her body and what that looks like to have the potential for motherhood be stripped from her and how she thinks about her personal longings despite also the end of the world and what it means to be living now and trying to have personal desire, but also being kind of pinned down by bodily functions that can fail, impending doom of death, and what it all means to just be human, I would say. This book is incredibly brainy, and I, I read this when I was in Amsterdam, and I feel like I was kind of in that like weird space of being on vacation mode and kind of going, 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 and so I feel like I read this at the wrong time, but I loved it so much that I know if I went back to this again, I would get so much more out of it. And it has everything that I love in a book that doesn't really have a plot, but explores a really interesting character who is thinking through what it means to be human today. And that's my favorite type of fiction. And so this one does that perfectly. Next, I have a linked short story collection called You Never Get It Back by Kara Blue Adams. This is a book that I just read a couple days ago, and it was one of the last books that I read this year. And I'm so glad I waited to post this video until I finished this book, because I think this book is absolutely incredible. This is a book that came from the recommendation of Brandon Taylor, who judged the John Simmons Award for Short Fiction, and this was the winner. I saw him post about this book, and so I had to pick it up. This book operates in the niche of certain fiction that I absolutely love, which is books about longing and loss. And this one follows one woman, Kate, and each short story is a different glimpse at a different point in her life. You see her navigating various losses, poverty, fraught familiar relationships, and the woman that she ultimately becomes by the end of this collection. This is a debut collection, and what I loved so much about this book was how Kara Blue Adams, she takes a lot of risks and plays with forms about this collection in terms of jumping from first and third person and also just kind of dabbling in other characters for a brief moment just to illuminate something bigger about the themes that she wants to explore in this collection. Namely, the first story here, which kind of anchors the rest of this collection, doesn't even involve Kate. It's its own standalone story about this tailor who's taking the measurements of a man named Loss. And this man's job is to basically catalog the various losses of people. And so clearly this is not a real job, but it was a really interesting way to kind of tee up the themes of loss and grief in the various minimal or substantial losses that people can have throughout their lives and the impacts that it ultimately has on them in totality. She puts Kate in a variety of settings, which really helps play in terms of developing her as a character and the various friendships and relationships that she has, how they're all kind of underpinned by the place where she experiences them. And so I think if you like that in a short story collection as well, it's kind of diverse in terms of its varying range of emotions and places and style. I think you will love this book and one that I see myself returning to a lot. Um, in the future. Coming in at number six, you knew it was coming. <laughs> it's Beautiful World Where Are You by Sally Rooney. This is a book I was the most excited for this year, I, I would say, and this one completely paid off for me. Out of all the books that I read this year, it might have been the most fun and just like heartwarming experience of reading that I've had. I was so excited to get my hands on a galley of this book, and once I actually had it in my hands, I just couldn't really believe it. I've said this before, but Sally Rooney is a writer who really got me back into reading. Around when Normal People came out, my local book club, that was their book club pick, and it was the first book club I ever attended, and I read the book for it, and I absolutely adored it. And so I was kind of nervous and excited to go to book club, and when I went there, I made some friends through it, and ever since then I've been like a, a huge reader as I'm on booktube now, but that's why I was so excited for this book and it completely, completely pays off. I won't go too much into this one. I know you all have probably heard about this book 
talked about to death at this point. But what I love so much about this is we have the signature Sally Rooney-isms in terms of having various young Irish people that are falling in and out of love. But what I love so much is that Sally Rooney is looking at her own place as a novelist and really examining what it means to write a novel when the end of the world is looming and what it means to try to find a purpose and whether the simplicity of trying to find love and familial happiness, is that a stupid thing to strive for? Is there something more that we should be trying to do? Should we be trying to change the world, or can we just find solace in the various relationships that we find in our own lives? There's some auto-fictional elements here with one of the characters, Alice, and I loved in the various letters that are told throughout this book from Alice to Eileen. The letters split up this book, and I just loved the examinations of Sally Rooney's own place as a novelist, as a very successful novelist, and how she has grappled with those questions since the success of Normal People. And I think she does it in a really interesting and beautiful way. And by the end of this book, I damn near cried. It really hit close to home as a mid-20-something trying to find his place in the world. I feel like this is a book that everyone in their 20s and early 30s should be reading. I think you will find something that you will love in this book. I know it's quite a divisive read, but I do think this one is worth your time if you're at all interested in Rooney's work. It is so good, and it really paid off for me. Woo! talking a lot. Alrighty, we've made it to the top five, and the stack is so good. Oh my god, I'm looking at it. It's so good. So, so good. So I'll start with number five. It is Assembly by Natasha Brown, another booktube darling, I would say. This is another depressed woman moving novel, but I think this one is wholly original. It had a sense of stakes that stayed with me long after I turned the final page. This is a book that can be read in one sitting. It is a brief little novella novel of sorts. We follow a black British woman who is working in finance. This book is all leading up to a party at her boyfriend's parents' house, and so you see her grappling with, with her anxieties about going to this party. Meanwhile, reflecting on how she got to where she is as a successful woman in finance, thinking about the various aspects of her identity and what she's had to sacrifice to get where she is in the various imposed structures as being a black woman operating under white supremacy, what it means to navigate that space and whether she wants to navigate that space. I don't really think it's a spoiler to say kind of what the level of stakes is that is presented in this book. I've seen it talked about a ton online, so if you don't want spoilers, jump ahead like 10 seconds, but in short, the narrator gets a cancer diagnosis and what kind of ensues from there is her trying to figure out what she wants to do about it, how much is it within her control and how much is not. One, with a cancer diagnosis, but two, being a black woman. And playing with those two ideas in such a masterful way, this book hit me in the gut. I was floored by the end of this book and just, I thought it was so excellent in the way that it adds this level of stakes that I didn't really see coming and was so unexpected from a depressed woman moving novel that I just think this one stands alone and it's just so exquisitely rendered in such a short, short uh, book. I think her playing with structure and brevity was so well done here, and then, so I think this one is worth all the hype. I'm shocked this one didn't make the Booker long list. I was like certain it would make the long list, if not the short list, but I do think if you're at all inclined to pick this one up, definitely do it. Next up is a book that completely took me by surprise. It is Wayward by Dana Spiota. This is a author that is new to me, but I know she is quite beloved. She is a creative writing professor at Syracuse University, so she works, I think, closely with George Saunders. He has a blurb on this book. This is a book that I didn't expect myself to love as much as I did, because to put it very simply, it follows a woman who is in her 50s who is experiencing menopause and what that means for her. And so personally, can't relate, but I will say I think Dana Spiota really explores motherhood and aging in such an excellent in beautifully presented way. Essentially, this book opens with about a woman in midlife who is making a decision that she didn't really expect herself to make. She is married and she has a daughter, and one day she sees his home and on a whim she buys it. But she's a wife with a daughter. And after making this decision, she's like, wait, what am I what am I doing? And so what I thought was so interesting here is purchasing a house rather than, you know, finding a new love or having an affair with a man being the turning point for her in her midlife. I think this decision for her to start her own home and what that means when you're already a wife and a mother, what that decision can mean for her and also the people around her. And the levels of morality that come with the examination of her choice in this book is just so interesting. And I think what I love so much about this book is the, is the play with structure here. So this book is set in 2017, another of the post-Trump books examining what it means to be a white woman in the Trump era. But this one is one interesting for looking at a woman in her 50s, but also it really takes, I think, white women older, especially white women, to task on their privilege and what it means to be able to have this opportunity to make your own decisions for yourself and how this one woman decides to do this and what it means for her to kind of make this certain, in a sense, selfish decision to leave her family for her own sake and what does she sacrifice when she does that and who 
kind of suffers from her decision and whether she should make the decision anyways as her own autonomous person. As a novel really examines personal choice and different freedoms and the opportunity cost of certain decisions. And so while on the surface this is a book about menopause, about what it means to be getting older, I don't think that book does it enough justice. It really examines the mother-daughter relationship here to a lesser extent the relationship with her husband, but really what it is is about personal choice and what it means to change as a person. Can we change? What things do we need under capitalism to change and what do we sacrifice when we try to make those changes? what all the implications are in making that decision. So this book is one that has stayed with me so much. I think about this book all the time. It is one that I constantly think about how just surprised I was by it and how much I was moved by it, despite being a mid-20s gay man, how much I related to this book overall. So yeah, I love this one. It's a book I will be returning to a ton and just makes me want to read all of her books. I feel like she's just a very skilled novelist in terms of the way that she plays with structure and theme in really interesting and innovative ways that kind of surprise you throughout the book. Lodge itself in my heart, adored it. All right, we have the top three. The three. And I feel so good about this three. So let's just get into it. It is first up, number three, Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. I thought I would love, but I didn't know I would love it this much. This is basically a book about three people deciding whether to have a baby together. We follow a trans woman named Reese, a detransition man named Ames, and Ames' boss, Katrina, who's a cisgendered woman. What kind of ensues in this book is Reese and Ames were once a couple when Ames was Amy. He has since detransitioned. You learn more about their breakup, but also in the meantime, Ames now becomes romantically involved with his boss, Katrina, and Katrina becomes pregnant. Ames knows that Reese really wanted to be a mother, and you see the various regrets that he has about the relationship with Reese. And once he learns that Katrina is pregnant, he wonders whether he can give Reese the baby that she always wanted. What kind of ensues from there is this very messy triangle relationship, trying to determine how they can kind of create this parenthood amidst a broken up couple, amidst the implications of detransitioning, about being a trans woman, about being a cisgendered woman with these relationships to these to these other people, and how the decision to be a parent kind of plays out in this very unique queer circumstance. This book is a romp and completely looks at trans identity in its face and really puts the reader to task in terms of understanding what it means to be trans, what it means to detransition, how parenthood is played out in this in this context. And I just thought it was a wholly original book that one has a ton of really interesting examinations of gender theory and the ways that Tori Peters captures this in this really interesting love triangle that I'd never really seen before in fiction. It's an incredibly witty and complex look at personal choice amongst a cast of queer characters. I don't know what more you could want, but this book has everything you could ever want in a book, at least for me. It did everything that I wanted it to. It left me surprised. I couldn't put it down. It's just incredible fiction. Coming in at number two, we have Crossroads by Jonathan Franzen. This was my first Franzen novel. This is the longest book that I read in 2021. I also read his previous book, The Corrections, after reading this one because I love this book so much, but I would say Crossroads remains my favorite of his so far. I wasn't sure what to expect because going into this book, I know Jonathan Franzen is quite a controversial author. I know that he's had a ton of controversy regarding the Oprah Book Club incident back in the day. I know that he often has, in his nonfiction, a lot of controversial opinions, but despite the controversy around Jonathan Franzen, it seems that the consensus is that he's a quite brilliant fiction writer. So going into this one, I wanted to see what the hype and controversy was about, and I was left staggered by this book. It is, in essence, a family saga that explores infinite questions that I found so illuminating in a really interesting context that I haven't really read before in fiction. So we follow this one family called the Hildebrands in the Midwest on Christmas Eve, Eve in 1971. And this book is about a bunch of different characters within this family at different crossroads in their lives. We see the patriarch of the family, Russ, pastor at their local church who has since fallen out of love with his wife, Marion, and he is trying to seduce one of the parishioners at his church. We learn about Becky, who is the younger teenager in her various personal social climbing in high school. We follow Perry, who is a genius, but also an addict. We see Clem, who is making the decision to fight in the Vietnam War despite his father's desires for him not to and to pursue a career in education, and underpinning all of this, the core of the story, in my opinion, is the mother, Marion. We learn more about how she got to where she is and the very secrets that she's kept from her family for the sake of them. And so this book, overall, I could go into the depths of this book and talk about it nonstop. I have a separate video review for this, so if you want a little bit more of an in-depth examination of why I love this book so much, check that out. But I will say this book is a ton about religion and faith, but this book isn't a particularly preachy book. It's really at its core about morality and the various decisions that we make in a familial context and the implications that, the, that those have on our family. Whether the decisions that we make for ourselves can be reckoned with how the consequences play out for a family. Seeing Jonathan Franzen through just damn near perfect prose was a joy to read. It's unputdownable. These characters you've come to learn and 
You spend so much time with them over the course of almost 600 pages that I just didn't want to leave them. You often come to hate their actions at many times throughout this book, but overall, it's an immensely rewarding read. It's the start of a trilogy, and I cannot wait to see where Jonathan Franzen takes these characters and this family in the next two installments. It was a big, brainy literary fiction read that I just couldn't get enough of. Okay, last but absolutely not least, this is the book that I talk about nonstop on my channel. I will never shut up about it. I am obsessed with it. I've watched so many author interviews to learn more about this book and how it was constructed about the writer herself. It's just a book that I think about daily. Whenever I pick up new books that touch on any of the themes presented here, I think about how does it stack up to fake accounts? I'll say it, it's fake accounts by Lauren Euler. This book kind of reset my brain, I would say, in terms of how I approach reading literary fiction. This really became the new metric for me, the new bar for pushing the limit in terms of what it means to write a contemporary literary fiction novel that plays with auto-fictional elements. Lauren Euler is so tapped into the current contemporary novel, and she really rips it apart and puts it back together again in her own creation, ode to the novel overall. In terms of structuring this book in a very traditional way, it's told with beginning, middle, and end. There's a couple other parts in here. But amidst all of that, she plays with different forms, with different structures, she uses parody in such a brilliant way that becomes this perfect original reflection of the contemporary novel. This book follows our unnamed narrator who makes a decision on the eve of Donald Trump's inauguration to snoop through her boyfriend's phone and she discovers that her boyfriend is a right-wing conspiracy theorist online which she had no idea about and what happens after that i will leave as a surprise to you but this book while it is deeply auto-fictional and reflective within the interior mind of this one woman it has all of the makings of a traditional depressed woman moving novel a thinky narrator thinking about her personal desires her complaints with the world all that is in here but euler does something a little bit more with this book or a lot more with this book she really looks at contemporary novels she criticizes them if you don't know lauren euler is also a critic and she before publishing this book was quite known for her scathing takedowns of certain contemporary novels and a lot of that criticism is contained within this novel which I thought was so interesting how she kind of blends it with this quite pacey plot that I found. I've seen a lot of criticism for this book say that nothing really happens in this book it's just one woman who was just insufferable and her thinking about things but I think that doesn't really give this book enough credit for what it does in terms of taking apart all of the stereotypes of the contemporary novel. At one certain point in here which kind of solidified this book as just completely brilliant for me was when she begins writing in fragmentary style in a parody of what I found to be Jenny Offal's work, in which the narrator questions whether her novel could be best told in the fragmentary style since that's what she's reading so much in contemporary fiction. And you quickly learn that it's not the avenue that she should proceed down, arguably like the weakest part of the novel, but it's intentionally weak, kind of playing on how odd and poor it is to try to splice a narrator's mind into different fragments and how it doesn't really work too well. But even for it being fragmentary and not as successful, Euler does it in one of the best examples that I've ever found in a fragmentary structure. So props to her for laughing at something, but also doing it really well. I thought it was really interesting. But, but in terms of plot, we see this narrator after something happens with her boyfriend, after she snoops through the phone, she goes to Berlin, she goes on a bunch of different dates, and she embodies different astrological stereotypes in her personality on these dates, creating fake personas or fake accounts, as this book is very online as well. She has taken all of the best elements of contemporary fiction that are so popular right now. She takes the internet, she takes social media, she takes fragments, she takes an unnamed narrator with certain aspects of Lauren Euler's own identity, she adds some literary criticism in here, she reflects on the state of the world post Donald Trump. It is just so intelligent and every single page I was like how is she so smart? She just taps into everything that I personally find interesting in contemporary fiction and distills it into one novel. And just seeing her put all of the thoughts to page in a one a really smart but also two just very interesting and engaging book in which you want to know what's going on with her and the things that happen with her boyfriend i just think it plays this really interesting dichotomy of social and cultural critique and also just being a really damn good and unputdownable novel this is that rare gem that i did not expect to find in 2021 and i this will be the new standard for me going into <laughs> new books i always think like will this book be better than fake accounts and so far nothing's beat it. So yeah, one of my all-time favorites. This book holds a special place in my heart. It just does everything that I want fiction to do. It is that one novel that I just think to where I'm like, yep, that's what I want out of a book. And that's crazy to find. So shout out Lauren Euler for being a mad genius and writing this incredible novel. It's just so good. So that is my top 15. I talked for so long. I couldn't shut up about these books. This is going to be a pain to edit. So 
please, if you like this video at all, give it a like. Subscribe to my channel if you like my content. I would really appreciate it. Let me know what the best book you read this year was for fiction or nonfiction, whatever you want to tell me. And since this was my favorite book of the year, I want to leave you with a reading of the first paragraph of this book because it is quite possibly my favorite intro to any book ever. I think it's so perfect and just you'll see what I mean. So I'll catch you in the next one. And if you want to stick around for a quick reading of this book and a quick selling point for why you should read it, here we go. Consensus was the world was ending, or would begin to end soon, if not by exponential environmental catastrophe, then by some combination of nuclear war, the American two-party system, patriarchy, white supremacy, gentrification, globalization, data breaches, and social media. People look sad on the subway, in the bars. Decisions were questioned, opinions rearranged. The same grave epiphany was dragged around everywhere. We were transitioning from only one retrospectively easy past to an inarguably more difficult future. We were, it could no longer be denied, unstoppably bad. Although the death of any hope for humanity was surely decades in the making, the result of many intersecting systems described forbiddingly well, it was only that short period between the election of a new president and his holding up a hand to swear to serve the people's interests that made clear what had happened, that we were too late. Like, shut up. It's so good. Read this book. It's incredible. If there's one book you read this year, make it this one. All right. Bye, everyone.